welcome everyone and welcome to the session of our um, second Emancipation Day panel discussion. This year for our panel discussion we have um, a very interesting list of persons and we are happy that we have with us um, Adele Halliday, our equity lead at the, Uni the United Church office, leading us in as moderator for this evening. Emancipation Day, as you know, is the date in the, on the 1st of August when across the then British Empire, slavery was abolished. This is the second year in Canada that we are having the full Emancipation Day experience. And so um, I would really hope that we fully appreciate and celebrate the day as we are having it. I begin with a word of prayer and after which I will hand over to Adele to lead us in the process. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you are the creator of all and that you have created all human beings in your image and likeness. You have stamped each person with special uniqueness and all persons are bear your image. Through that image you call us to reflect your goodness, justice and love to all the world. Remind us that when we speak out for justice, mercy and compassion, we are displaying the attributes we find in you. As we come to offer to you what we believe you are worth. Show us how to display you in everything we do. Show us how to respect your image in all human beings and help us to defend your image that is found in all human beings. Amen. Let me hand over to Adele, who will take it from here. Amen, and thank you, Paul. Um... The person who was just speaking is a Reverend Dr. Paul Douglas Walfall, who's a member of the Black Clergy Network and um, has uh, played a lead role in organizing this panel. So thank you, Paul, for um, your leadership and for um, welcoming us and gathering us in prayer today. So my name is Adele Halliday. I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the United Church of Canada, and I'm honored to be moderating this panel today. We have a wonderful list of panelists who will be with us today. Um, I'll offer a short introduction to them and then a longer introduction to them a bit later. Uh, the four panelists who are with us are Carol B. Duncan, who is a professor of religion and culture at Wilfrid Laurier University. We also have Charmaine Nelson, who is a professor of art history and a tier one Canada research chair in transatlantic black diasporic art and community engagement at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University. We have Russell Burns, who is an entrepreneur and member of the National Indigenous Council of the United Church of Canada. And Pedro Welch, who is a retired deputy principal of the University of the West Indies and former Dean at the Faculty of Humanities and Education and professor of social and medical history in the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies. So welcome to all of all of our panelists and welcome to all of you. Um, the panelists today will be engaging with a series of questions uh, and also engaging with one another. Um, all of you who are here may also have questions. You're welcome to please at any point put those questions into the chat and uh, the panelists will respond to those as they can. Um, so please feel free to ask questions at any time. We will first hear from Carol, uh, who will respond to a question to help us uh, set a bit of context in terms of why Emancipation Day is important. Um, but first, perhaps a fuller, uh, a fuller introduction to Carol. I offered a very brief one earlier, but here's a, a fuller introduction to who Carol is. 
Carol B. Duncan is a professor of religion and culture at Wilf Wilford Loya University, and her research focuses on Black church studies in Canada, Caribbean religions in transnational and diasporic contexts, religion and popular culture, and women's and gender studies. She has served as an academic consultant and appeared in the award-winning documentary, Seeking Salvation, A History of the Black Church in Canada. A researcher, teacher, and scholar, Professor Duncan is at heart a chronicler of cultural and religious life in the African diaspora. And in addition to numerous articles and chapters, Professor Duncan is the author of This Spot of Ground, Spiritual Baptists in Toronto, co-author of Black Studies and Introduction, and is a contributing editor to the Encyclopedia of Caribbean Religions. She's co-editor of Womenist and Fem Black Feminist Response to Tyler Perry's Productions and the Black Church Studies Reacher, Reader. Her latest book project is Black Religion and Popular Culture, an introduction. So a warm welcome to Carol. Carol, I wonder if you might respond to this question. Why is an acknowledgement and celebration of Emancipation Day relevant for Canada and Canadians in the 21st century? So over to you, Carol, please. Thank you very much, Adele. Um, good evening to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, whatever your time zone is. And uh, thank you to uh, Paul for the invitation to participate in the panel. Greetings to my fellow and sister uh, panelists as well. Greetings from Waterloo, Ontario, which is situated on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Oh, let me tell you a moment about this. I am not. Okay, I think I'm hearing somebody. Um. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to respond. So, you know, um, for me, uh, Emancipation Day is an important celebration of uh, liberation of enslaved peoples, of freedom, and of human rights. As a descendant of enslaved Africans who toiled on sugar plantations in the Caribbean on both sides of my family, this is a highly personal issue. I grew up with carnival celebrations as a child in Antigua. I lived there after my birth in England and before moving to Canada 50 years ago. And so August 1st and the August holiday weekend were indelibly linked with the vibrancy and life of carnival. And commemorating the Emancipation Day 188 years later, is an important act of honoring the experience, the lived experience of enslaved, and also honoring um, our own communities here in Canada. Some would say, well, what about Canadians who are not directly connected to the experience of transatlantic slavery, uh, who are not peoples of African descent, who have experienced being labeled uh, as Black in terms of the uh, racial iconography of the Americas. Why celebrate? Yeah. Well, we celebrate because Canada was part and parcel of the Atlantic world, a part of the triangular trade linking Africa with the Americas and with Western Europe. We celebrate also to commemorate the formal legislative end of slavery in the British Empire, and Canada too had a history of slavery from 1628 until the ending of slavery with the Abolition Act in 1834. So we do not get off as a country with an image of being the um, honorific heroes, the land of the Underground Railroad. And as important as that is, I was just in Gray County yesterday in Owen Sound, at the 162nd of the 160th anniversary of their Emancipation Day celebration, we still need to think about what that means for us um, today. Let me share with you a very short uh, story in uh, conclusion, because I know our time is limited here. 
My maternal grandmother was born in the early years of the 20th century, 1902. She was a long lifer. She lived most of the 20th century until the 1990s. She was born in Dominica, but grew up in Antigua and thought of herself as an Antiguan. Her paternal grandfather, John Henry Sebastian, was actually born in 1833 in Montserrat in the waning days of enslavement. He was a long lifer as well and she knew him well, she talked with him, and she shared with me our stories. If we look at time, I'm separated from John Henry by, you know, 132 years, something like that, in terms of our birth. He's not within my living memory, but I feel as if I know him, because from a storyteller's point of view, I'm only one teller from his spoken voice. When we commemorate and when we remember, we acknowledge the experience of the enslaved and their visual traditions, their cooking traditions, their language for Caribbean people, Patois, for instance, um, all of those gardening traditions and their religious traditions as well, too. Those are alive uh, with us. So I think that the commemoration of that lived experience placing Canada within the Atlantic world and also celebrating human rights is one of the great reasons for um, acknowledging Emancipation Day. It means that when we look at an image like this, and I'll very briefly share this with you, this is a famous print by William Clark from 1823 showing sugar production on the Delaps sugar estate well, that's in Antigua. I know where Delaps is. And on country drives, my uncle would take us through um, the rural side of the island back in the 60s and 70s. And we would see the sugar mills in the distance as we drove by. And they were a visual evidence of this reality, which for my grandmother, she always talked about slavery days, was only a story away from her grandfather, and I'll end there. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for opening us in such a, a, a good way and giving us some very concrete ways for why we, cel why we celebrate Emancipation Day and reminding us of the 188 years. I'm wondering if any of our panelists might also want to respond briefly to this same question. Um, you've heard Carol's uh, um, Carol's introduction and her words. Uh, would any of you like to add a few more? Pedro or Charmaine? I think what I'm going to say will respond in a way, so I can wait if Pedro wants to say something. Yeah, if I'm prepared, uh, please, uh, please go, please go right ahead, and I'll follow you. I have a couple of comments. Okay, so how about we hear from Charmaine and then we'll hear from Pedro. A few words in response to this same question. Okay, so I'm gonna screen share with you all. Let's see here and jump in. Can you see that Adele? Okay, so yes. I'd like to lend my thanks too to Paul and Adele, the fellow panelists for all of you for spending uh, you, part of your weekend with us. I'm in uh, at NASCAD University, which is in Halifax, which is in Nigmagi on the East Coast of Canada. And I'm very grateful to be joining you. So I approach this through the lens of my discipline, which is art history. So I come at the study of transatlantic slavery and Canadian slavery through, through the archive, the 400 year archive of art and visual culture that was left behind mainly by um, the enslavers uh, for pro-slavery ends, okay? So I'll just jump in here. So the first thing I just wanna orient us, what are we even talking about when we talk about transatlantic slavery? A lot of people don't know the parameters of this. We're talking about several European nations that were empire building in the Americas, Britain, Denmark, and Norway are often forgotten. Also, Sweden should be on this list. France, Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands. We're talking about a 400-year history. 
Cuba did not abolish slavery till 1886 and Brazil until 1888. So we need to really think about the fact that transatlantic slavery almost came into the 20th century. Now, the expropriation of Africans was central to this process as the unfree labor in the Americas for these European empires. And only black Africans were always deemed by these empires to be always enslavable. Sometimes indigenous people were enslaved, many times they were not, but black Africans always seemed to be enslavable. Now, in terms of the loss and the suffering, the trauma in terms of um, our ancestors, 4 million died during the forced marches to the West African coast. That is before even being put on a slave ship. Two million died at sea. This is what we call the middle passage, which is literally the space of the Atlantic Ocean between the East Coast of the Americas and the West Coast of Africa. So this is a vast unmarked grave for us where we know that two million of our ancestors died of illness, corporal punishment, murder, and suicide. Um, and then 12.5 million of our ancestors survived. And that's why we, who we as the Blacks in diaspora today are descended from, those 12.5 million who survived and made it to the Americas. And they were scattered from Argentina to Canada and the Caribbean, and some were forced to accompany their enslavers to, uh, to Europe. And though that is a little studied population, those who were forced to go to Europe. Let's see here. So when we're talking about transatlantic slavery, often I get pushback when I do lectures, especially from Canadian audiences saying, listen, slavery has hap happened in time immemorial. You know, that's just a part of the human condition. No, transatlantic slavery was uniquely horrific for specific reasons. Number one, it was the first race-based slavery ever conceptualized. Race as we know it today did not exist prior to transatlantic slavery. Race is a so-called biological concept of human difference that was created within a hierarchy. And the visual artists before photography, the printmakers were in there working with the, what today we'd call the pseudoscientists, phrenology, chronology, human biology, trying to create this hierarchy with surprise, surprise, whiteness always at the top. And you can see in this image, of course, the so-called Negro or the Black African is in the middle and being positioned visually as being closer to the simian or to animals. And there's a plethora of imagery pre-photography and then photography takes over with these human sciences, of course. The other thing really distinct about transatlantic slavery is that under colonial law to be a slave was initially to be cargo with an insurance value on your head on the slave ship manifest. You were not considered a human. So when you try to trace our ancestors back to the slave ship, what you get is adult male, adult female, boy or girl. You usually do not get even a first name at that point. Now within legal discourse across the Americas to be enslaved was to be chattel or movable personal property. Like the chair I'm sitting on, like the desk in front of me. You were not considered a human being. So you can imagine then the extreme extraordinary brutality that manifested from that logic of enslaved black people and indigenous people not being seen as humans under the law. And we can see this too in various ways in the archive. This is a slave auction ad from Nova Scotia from Halifax. And you can see that the black man being auctioned here, the enslaved man is listed simply as a Negro man thrown in with a, a bunch of inanimate objects and a horse. So this is the objectification, the thingification of our ancestors in terms of the chattel status under the law. Now, in terms of the slave ship, we of course had pushback from anti-slavery or abolitionist societies, and they were excellent at pinpointing the use of popular visual culture as a mechanism of a mass produced art to get into the hands of the public to try to change their minds about slavery, stop them from wanting to consume coffee or sugar or cotton in terms of, do you know where this is coming from? Do you know how it's being produced? This is how we end slavery by pushing back economically against the system. But art was at the heart of this. And what you're looking at is a cross section of the ship and every black mark represents a human being being so-called tight packed into the cargo hold. Again, our ancestors on these voyages were considered cargo. And this is an example of tight packing an up close image of what tight packing looked like. So we have to really stop and think about the brutality of this too and consider who survived. Who are the 12 million who survived? How strong physically did you have to be, mentally did you have to be to survive the eight week 
two month, six week voyage from the west coast of Africa to the Americas. The third part of transatlantic slavery that's particularly brutal is that it was organized deliberately within what we call a matrilineal order, which is diametrically opposed to how Europeans organize their own life and legal and economic worlds, which is everything comes from the father, not so with sla slavery, everything came from the mother. So what this did then was incentivize rape and sexual coercion because enslavers understood that to get your enslaved female pregnant was to make new property for yourself because the child born to your enslaved female belonged to you as the person who owned her. So rape and sexual coercion were ubiquitous in slavery and that's where you get concepts and practices of things like breeding. And of course this spawned a terminology through the, a term called miscegenation. And you have to even think, why did they even need a term like miscegenation? Miscegenation means sex between races. And then you, start, you have an explosion of terminology like mulatto, quadroon, octroon, where white people were trying to track and map the blackness in enslaved people and free blacks as a so-called pathology, again, think back to the pseudosciences that had to be traced, okay, in protection of a supposed white purity. Now, just before I end here, um, I want us to think about then how we actually do the research as scholars is very difficult because what we're left with from those empires is mainly pro-slavery texts and manuscripts. So one of a kind handwritten documents are the manuscripts or the printed, once a printing press comes along, the printed documents. And as an art historian, I'd like to remind you those empires created a 400 year archive of art and visual culture that many, many historians overlook, okay? And other scholars. So the problem here though, is that we're left with very few documents created by the ancestors, by the enslaved people, because why? No leisure time, material deprivation, strategically not allowed to learn to read and write, like often laws on the books across the Americas that there are, there are legal punishments um, often physical punishments that were legal and legitimized uh, to disincentivize enslaved people from learning to read and write. So under those conditions, of course, our ancestors didn't have the time, the material wherewithal or the ability often to leave traces of their own lives. So unfortunately, as scholars were trying to read against the grain, um, the archival holdings and the traces left by the very people who are trying to hold them in bondage. So this is the difficulty. For instance, you never go as a, a scholar of slavery to try to look for a birth certificate for an enslaved person because they weren't issued birth certificates because our ancestors were not considered human beings. So this is the, the, the difficulty too in trying to recuperate the lives, experiences, the worlds of the enslaved. And I'll just end here just to remind us all when you consider the question, what did slave owners or enslavers control? Everything about the enslaved. They literally owned these, these human beings they, who they didn't consider to be human beings. They were considered again chattel under the law, controlled everything about their bodies, their sexuality, their mobility, their labor, what the type of labor, duration of the labor, where you could move around, if you could move around, what you were gonna wear, how many, you know, pieces of, or of clothes you had, everything about your life was in the hands of the enslaver. But I'd like to point out too then that we find across the Americas prolific and continuous resistance to slavery from the ancestors in various dimensions, including the most obvious like resistance through uh, burning down a plantation or trying to resist through work slowdowns, feigning illness, resisting as females and males sexual violence, and also what is something we find in the archive, tremendous amount in terms of print culture, runaways, people who would flee from the owner. And in the context of the colonial world, that was considered self-theft because you did not own yourself. To run away was illegal because you were stealing yourself from your owner. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you for uh, reminding us of this uh, or outlining again the
realities of this race-based slavery and differentiating um, between this form of enslavement and other forms of slavery. And uh, again, outlining the um, objectification in this chattel form. So thank you for that. Um, just a reminder of who Charmaine is. Um, here's her fuller um, bio, bi uh, biography introduction. Uh, Charmaine A. Nelson is a professor of art history and a tier one Canada research chair in transatlantic black diaspora art and community en engagement and the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery at the NSCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She's the author of seven books and has made groundbreaking contributions to the fields of visual culture of slavery, uh, recent representation, black Canadian studies, and African Canadian art history. She was the visiting professor of Canadian studies at Harvard University and a Fields of the Future fellow at the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. So thank you once again to Charmaine. Um, just to remind anyone is welcome to ask questions at any time. You are welcome to write a question into the chat and any of our panelists can respond. Um, before we hear from our next panelist, I just wanted to see if any of the other panelists wanted to respond to what we've heard so far from Charmaine and also what we've heard from Carol. Um, you're welcome to continue to engage with one another um, based on the conversation so far, and anyone can ask questions in the chat. So a few minutes for uh, engagement with what we've heard so far. Um, permit me, if you will, um, to make the point that we've had a fairly comprehensive survey by my fellow panelists. Um, but I just think that I would like to add a few other things into the debate. Um, there is a researcher, um, Professor Joy DeGray, D-E-G-R-U-Y, Larry sometimes is added to her name, who has coined the term post-traumatic slave or slavery syndrome. Um, the relevance of, of, of this of, 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 um, celebration of emancipation um, for Canada and Canadians, and for that matter, to the entire diaspora of, of, of um, people of African descent in the, in the New World, is that we have been harmed. And the whole question of reparations which is a contemporary discussion, really has to do with the repair that must take place, um, the rehabilitation of our peoples. So that, uh, if, I, if I'm following Jacques Professor de Grey, um, the fact is that through the many years following emancipation to the contemporary period, there's still tremendous evidence of the harm and hurt that's taken place. Uh, it is not uncommon, and I'm using a Barbadian example here, for someone of African descent to say, I'm not African. I, I don't belong to that place. It is not also uncommon for persons to, to look at their color and to see something intrinsically evil or bad out the, the complexion of the color. So that for example, a little child is born and you may get a comment like this, and I'm going to use a, a fictitious name here. Have you seen Mavis's baby, her child? But it's so black, it is so black, as though, as though blackness is a, is a sin, blackness is a curse. That, that impacts on us. And then um, again, if I'm following um, Professor De Grey, I, I, my, my view is that, that because our people have what I may call a collective amnesia, or, or sometimes that is imposed on us, it is important for us not, and I, I'm, I know we use the term celebrate, but I would, I would have myself, if I had to choose an alternative to I would say, uh, that rather I would prefer to use the term reflection or to reflect, we ought to reflect on the past. Um, the emancipation is not yet complete. As we know, Bob Marley makes it abundantly clear that we should emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, mental enslavement. So that if we are trying to establish relevance and try to understand the relevance of, our, of, of the, the, the reflection on emancipation day, 
we, we ought to um, look at that reflection against the background of what is continuing to happen to our people. Our people are continuing to feel the effects of enslavement. And then to come out and the issue that was raised in one of the discussions that we had earlier, the whole question of time. Many of our people assume that the thing is so far away. I, I am I'm pretty aware that in Barbados, again, using another Barbados example, we have perhaps one of the greatest concentrations of centenarians in the Eastern Caribbean, from anywhere in the Eastern Caribbean. And I've worked out. We have people who are 105, 106. I had one relative who died at 107. And we have many persons whose fathers, grandfathers, could well have been enslaved. And, I'll, and we did mention that Cuba, um, in the case of Cuba, the enslavement ended in 1876. But, and of course, it went on in Brazil into the 1880s. So one has to remember that, um, that, the, that, that the thing is closer to us than we imagine. And, and the commemoration or reflection on Emancipation Day is really to remind our people that we haven't, we haven't, um, we haven't got so far from the thing yet. We are still in the process of emancipation. It's not just a day. It is, in fact, a process that is continuing. I will stop there because I think, I, I think I've added what I would want to add to the discussion. Thank you, Pedro, uh, for naming the importance uh, of, of reparations. And uh, in a moment, we'll ask you to go into maybe a bit more about what, uh, how what you might see, um, what reparations might look like. Um, and also for naming uh, the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Uh, so just a fuller introduction of Pedro, who we've just heard from. Professor Pedro Welch is a retired principal of the University of the West Indies and a former dean of the Faculties of Humanity and Education and professor of social and medical history in the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies. He is a recipient of many awards and these include a Commonwealth Scholarship in 1984 and the 1992 Johns Hopkins Fellowship. He has written or co-authored several articles and books, including Red and Black Over White, Free Colored Women in Pre-Emancipation Barbados, as well as Slave Society in the City, Bridgetown, Barbados, 1680 to 1834. He's also served as a historical consultant to the BBC and the NBC and has served for a number of years as chair of the Barbados Task Force on Reparations. He's also served as a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Caribbean History, and he's the current editor of the Journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. So thank you once again to Pedro. Um, in a moment, I'm going to open up uh, the panel for, uh, um, for, for further conversations, and I have a few questions, additional questions to um, engage with us. Um, but just to note, we were um, we had anticipated that there would be a fourth panelist with us, Russell Burns. Um, we are still hoping that he may be able to join us today. Maybe that he's having technical difficulties. Um, so perhaps I will offer his bio uh, in the hopes that he will be able to join us, um, hopefully sometime soon. Um, so Russell Burns has been an entrepreneur for the majority of his life. Russell's wealth of business experience includes being the owner and operator of first air duct and furnace cleaning, as well as experience in cross-border First Nations business transactions. First Nations Structures is Russell's current business venture, and Russell began his career in the business community of Massachusetts, formerly Hobanen, Alberta. These days, Russell spends the majority of his time enjoying retirement. Russell is Cree from the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, and Russell and his wife Charlene reside in Pon Ponoka, Alberta, and have three grandchildren, Jacob, Jenny, and Bertie. They have been married for 45 years. So as I noted, uh, Russell's not here at the moment, but we are hopeful that he may be able to join us sometime soon, and when he does, we will welcome him warmly and um, give him his time to speak. So in the meantime, with the panelists who are here, so that's Carol and Charmaine and Pedro. Um, I wonder if we might engage in some conversation together. We've already been able to have a rich conversation um, based on what you've shared so far. Um, uh, maybe, um, 
I'm wondering if maybe among you, if you might be willing to share a little bit more about reparations and what that might look like. Um, as well, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, what some of this might mean for churches uh, based on what you've been talking about so far. And once again, invitation for anyone who's here to um, share any questions that you might have in the chat uh, and we can bring those to the panelists as well. So let's uh, uh, hear from our panelists a bit more. Um, so one, a bit more about reparations. What does it mean? What might it look like concretely for people today? As well as in the conversation that we've been having so far, what would you say is the relevance of this, um, particularly for churches? Um, what is the church's role? What, what would you name for churches? Is there a call to action, inspiration, anything like that? So over to you panelists, please. Can, can I back up to Adele on that too and say that first, Here's the thing, in order to have a really fruitful conversation and action on reparations, you need um, the populace to first know that slavery happened in the region. So where we are in Canada, sadly, is that we have a situation where the majority of Canadians and people living in Canada have never had the opportunity to learn that slavery happened here. And just to give a really brief context, when I said the 400 years of transatlantic slavery, in the regions that became Canada, we're talking about two empires, Britain and France, 200 years of slavery from the 1600s until 1834, August 1st, 1834, when the British Empire abolished slavery, we had to in this region abolish because we were still loyal to the British post-revolutionary war and war of 1812. So, that 200 years of history is not being taught anywhere at any moment in Canadian curriculum, not from K to 8, not from 9 to, to 12, not in SAGEPs in Quebec, not in colleges in other parts of the country and not in universities. There's a handful of people like myself, Carol, and other scholars who have jobs at Canadian universities who would routinely teach a class or part of a class on Canadian slavery. Whereas there are quite a few scholars in Canada employed in Canadian universities and colleges who are experts in transatlantic slavery in semi-tropical or tropical regions. So the people focus on Haiti, Jamaica, right, Brazil. But the people teaching Canada, where are they? And what we do as a nation in February, as we know, when you're allowed to talk about Black Canadians, is we roll out the 31 years of the Underground Railroad, right? We roll out right from 1834 is what we want to talk about to 1860 um 61 the, the american civil war and that my friends is what we like to talk about having supposedly freed the african americans who are fleeing north but i want to remind everybody that if you study like i do the fugitive slave ads what you see is that pre-1834 enslaved people in canada were running south they're running anywhere. They're trying to get onto ships to get away from their enslavers in this region. So it, this is a complete falsehood that we have been teaching and enshrining three decades and want nothing to do with and don't want to talk about two centuries. And until we have that conversation for the majority of Canadians, they will not understand the repar reparations conversation because the reparations for what? They don't understand what needs to be repaired. So we have a lot of heavy lifting to do in this nation around this conversation. Um, and it starts, I think, with education about slavery itself and what that looked like. And Adele, just one last thing. When I talk to Canadian audiences, what they want to insist when they can see that slavery happened here, that it must have been kinder and gentler. Why? Because there were fewer people enslaved. And I want to say, how did you come up with that? Where did you pull that? What hat did you pull that out of? How did how fewer enslaved people mean to you? How does that result in the idea of being be treated better? And one of the things that I pushed for and recently published on is for us to think about how for our ancestors who were enslaved in a place like Canada and American North Argentina, they would have been suffering also from a psychological dimension of trauma in terms of isolation from self and from community in terms of the small population sizes. So imagine someone like Joe, who was enslaved in Quebec City, who we know was African born because by mm -hmm. fugitive slave say that he was born in um, Africa. But what did that mean for him to be enslaved in Quebec City, especially if he had a memory of Africa? 
and his language and his spirituality and all that that was lost to him being thrown into a community of minority community of black Creoles, people born in the Americas. And on top of that, the complexity of that population, they're speaking French, they're speaking English, or some of them are speaking Spanish, German, Dutch. And who amongst them could Joe turn to to try to you know, remember and pr practice his African religion? So I think for us, Adele, the reparations discussion in Canada will become fruitful once we have the educational component to let people understand what slavery was and that it happened here. And that's how behind we are in this nation. Excellent, thank you for the response, Charmaine. I see Carol has her hand up. So over to you, yeah. Carol, please. Thank you, Charmaine, for that. I, um, I wanna touch on a couple of things um, uh, to, to add to what you've said is the idea too that um, the system of slavery and the codification by race shaped the experiences, not only of the enslaved and people coded as black, but also of whites. Okay, so Nell Irvin Painter, um, similar to points raised by Pedro in her work on uh, soul murder, the idea that the psychological ramifications of enslavement were so detrimental and crucial in shaping notions of blackness that they harmed not only uh, people of African descent, but the, the creation also of whiteness in terms of this codified system of race also had its costs. We can also look at um, the work of people like David Rodiger, who's a, a historian whose work looks at uh, the creation of labored classes and the, the uh, wages of whiteness is uh, an important study which looks at the development, in fact, of whiteness as a particular form of racialized categorization <clears throat> uh, to which uh, groups like the Irish, um, uh, other folks coming over a uh, second half of the 19th into the early uh, 20th century uh, from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, that uh, their uh, acceptance as white people, as white folks, was not automatic. That it too has its particular codes. And those are also rooted in the ways in which labor was organized in the Americas. And so um, the idea then that Emancipation Day is solely about the experience of the enslaved, I think the larger colonial picture which both Pedro and Charmaine have outlined and pointed to uh, is important to keep in mind. And here the role of the church is significant. Uh, here in Canada, if there's anybody here in, uh, you know, from a, another uh, context, um, we've just had a week of uh, papal visits um, in the country, a historic visit, a penitential visit in which um, uh, the Pope, uh, made apology to Indigenous peoples for the experiences of that they suffered in residential schools organized and run by the Catholic Church. Now that's one part of the experience of colonization in terms of the process of assimilation through these educational ex, um, institutions. But the role of religion, the, the Christianity entering as a colonizing um, religion uh, in the Americas, its legacies are with us today. And I've been privileged to be able to have discussions over the years uh, with members of the United Church here, but also uh, in the US, in the Caribbean and uh, in other places, uh, especially in the last three years or so, two and a half years of the pandemic electronically to look at the legacies of Christianity as the most broadly perhaps globalized religion, but why is that? It's through the process of colonization. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, these are linked reparations, Call the process of colonization, what is the role of the church, the church's historical role, and very close into the present day, the last residential school in Canada, 
uh, didn't close until 1996. So mm -hmm. I've been teaching at Laurier for 1997, 25 years, only a year after that, I've been teaching in universities in some form um, for over 30 years. And so, you know, that's recent, that's within my lifetime. Uh, there are people who are my generation, indigenous folks who've had that experience. These are not separate to me. The fact that Africans were enslaved to work mm -hmm. on lands of indigenous peoples is a part of the discussion, is a part of the um, experience of globalization, globalization of capital um, here in the Americas as a part of empire building. So those are the points that I wanted to make to, on reparations and, and the church. So thank you, Carol, for clearly linking reparations, colonization, and religion, the church. Um, I know we're, we are missing uh, some of the perspectives of Russell, who would um, further elaborate on the role of colonization as well. Uh, and thanks again to Charmaine for um, clearly naming the need for education in Canada. And uh, much of what you said, um, yes, <laughs> resonates with me and many others around uh, what happens during Black History Month and how there's celebration of the Underground Railroad and um, all the history that happened before that is not often talked about or talked or, or named. So a real name for education, um, a real need for uh, continuing linking these uh, broad concepts of um, uh, reparations, colonization, and religion. And we have a question in the chat um, that speaks to some of this. Um, and so wonder if some among you might be willing to respond to these questions that come from Lawrence Cumming. And the questions are, wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit on the question of reparations. Why has it taken so long for reparations to get onto the international agenda? What might reparations look like? And are there any promising initiatives? So um, is there anything that any among you might want to say about those questions that have emerged? Well, again, if I might, um, and if you permit me to um, just to say, uh, well, to follow on on what was said a little earlier and then come back to the question of reparations, uh, uh, one of the issues that uh, that plagues us in terms of our attempts to sensitize uh, our publics on the question of enslavement is that we have often sanitized uh, what enslavement looks like. In other words, um, much of the material that people will read or will see uh, is material that, that, that has been mitigated uh, to, um, to some extent by um, by time, although time should, should not be an excuse for missing the importance of what happened to our people. I, I, I'm thinking that as I'm speaking about the, the narratives that we can have access to of persons who experience enslavement. And I'm thinking of people like Equiano. Now I know there's a debate on Equiano okay. and his origins, but the fact remains that if you read the, um, the, the narrative of Equiano, he describes in, uh, I want to say, say, excruciating detail, what happened to him when he was captured, when he was put on, 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 on the slave ship. And also, when I think of another enslaved man called Jeffrey Brace, um, who is the subject of, a, of an, a book edited by Carrie Winter. Um, Jeffrey Brace is another enslaved man who sailed uh, from Africa and, and, and entered the New World and he also describes his conditions. And unfortunately, one of the descriptions that he offers is of his being placed in, in, in Barbados, um, in the, in the Barracoon, if you may call it that, that's more an African term, but I place in the Caribbean context, um, of an enslaver, a man, strange enough, called Welch. And I, I don't know why, they, why, why he has the name Welch. I mean, I... I, 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 I don't claim any connection with him, but this man, this man Welch beat um, Jeffrey Brace to within an inch of his life. He lands in Barbados. He gets beaten and he's beaten simply because he's fed some tainted meat. 
and he pukes on the floor. And for doing that, he's beaten within an inch of his life. He describes that experience and he describes for us what happened um, to him on the ship. And when we read that, I mean, it, it is vivid that, 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 that few persons could read it and not, not feel to be, to be moved by, by the narrative. Now that's G.H.F. Jeffrey Brace. And Criano came across the ocean in the transatlantic slave trade and found himself employed on a slaver trading through between the Caribbean uh, territories. Now, the thing about uh, Kriano's um, journey through the Caribbean is that he is employed on a slave ship. An enslaved man employed on a slave ship sailing through the Caribbean. And he says, and I, I, I can't quote him exactly because I don't have the quotation to hand, but he says that he was a witness to the depredations of, on females, not 10 years old, by the, by the sailors on those slavers. I mean, you have to read again at Kriana to, to get a sense of, 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 the, of the reality of what it is. And then I'm thinking of the narrative given to us by an enslaver himself, a man called Thomas Thistlewood, who, when his enslaved people ran away, they committed marinage, sought to cure that marinage by getting an enslaved man called <laughs> to defecate in the mouths of those enslaved persons who have been caught trying to renovate. They would then take a guy and, 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 and cover their mouth so they cannot spit out the feces. Uh, how many of our people have ever heard of that? How many of our, our, our publics have, uh, have ever really, uh, as it were, seen through, through the lens of the person who uh, experiences these uh, these uh, these traumatic experiences has ever seen that. So I'm, I'm my view is that one of the one of the the, the, um, the important issues in in our in our discussion and debate has to do with what we need to do to sensitize our public, to sensitize people as to what happened. And then, having said that, I come back now to the question of reparations. Reparations are a process. As chairman of the Barbados Task Force of Reparations and a member of the, of the CARICOM um, Reparations Commission, I can say to you that, um, that we've always argued that reparations is not, is not a sprint. It's not, it's not a UCM Bolt sprint. It's a, a long distance race. And, and there, there are some persons who are uh, perhaps a little impatient because they, they, they see the thing as dragging on for too long. But we have to recognize that there are other parties involved. The European countries are not necessarily that happy that the matter has been raised. If I may um, point to the CARICOM Reparations Commission and to the work of CARICOM itself, um, letters have been sent to various European countries. Um, bring up the issue and, and, and asking for a discussion and dialogue. Um, we have had a visit by one former British Prime Minister who visited the Caribbean and said, um, you know, get over it. Get over it. That is the response. So, so when we, even though we want to see a process of reparations take place, we have to acknowledge that it is not going to be easy there's going to be a lot of difficulty because there is a reactionary, uh, reactionary force out there that is not prepared to give us our due. Um, in the United States of America, of course, you know the whole question of 40 acres on a mule and the discussion as, as we surface in the United States of America. But of course, in each of these situations, the fact is just that reparations is a necessary process. But reparations is not only a matter of getting of a monetary fix that will, we hope, solve a lot of our problems. Reparations also has to do, <coughs> excuse me, with self-repair. Because, as I said earlier, many of us, many of us in the diaspora uh, uh, still have a problem. Uh, in my own experience, I've, I've met with persons who have offered the view 
that black people can't run businesses. That if you want a business to be run, you give it to a white man. That's a, that's the sign of the of a mental uh, a, a, a psychiatric problem that needs to be solved. So we uh, we definitely need to have to have um have a, an immediate onslaught on the ignorant, the abysmal ignorance that exists out there in our various societies. And then finally, before we move on, but I, since you, you see the church has been raised, I know I'm going to say a little bit more about that, about that later, but there are a lot of myths concerning the church and enslavement. The church is part of, the, of what we call part of an amalgam of social, political, and colonial structures that underlie the continual denial to Blacks of their expectations of self-actualization. But having said that, have acknowledged that the church plays an important role, we also have to come to the other side of the coin because there is a myth that has been perpetuated by many researchers that our forefathers were brainwashed into Christianity. And my argument here is that that does not give due respect to the capacity of our ancestors, our forefathers, to make choices, to make reasoned choices. Many of our forefathers who joined churches, who became Christianized, who didn't were Christianized because they were, it was put on them, because it was something that, was, that they were brainwashing to. But they took, accepted Christianity because they've read into the Christian narrative something that they felt spoke to their condition and their freedom. And, and there are some myths concerning the, the, the Christian message. There's a notion that, 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 uh, that, we, that we hear often that, um, that, that the, 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 the Christian message is one that supports slavery through. That's a misreading of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Uh, later, if I have the opportunity, I can share with you some of the references in the very scriptures themselves that where uh, the message is antithetical to the notion of enslavement of the human beings. There are times when, uh, when, 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 when of course, the, is, the is, Israelites those, the, um, enslave others. That is true. That is part of the narrative of description of what people did. But that is not the, the, um, to say that the scriptures encouraged and supported enslavement. But we'll come back to that, I, I, I'm pretty certain. Before the, Adele, uh, can I jump in, Adele? Yes, so please. Please, I, Charmaine, please do. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the issue of uh, two, the two issues that I didn't respond to Christianity, um, the question on Christianity. So from my perspective, I think for the church to be a legitimate voice in conversations around the histories of slavery in Canada and transatlantic slavery in general, and conversations about re redress, repair, and reparations, the church must first atone because the church had a central role in, um, in uh, like many, many enslavers. Uh, and of course the European states that were colonizing uh, and building their empires in the Americas were, um, they were Christian countries. And at that point, of course, we're talking about the 1400s to the 1800, there was, you know, at least in the, the early centuries, early modern period, there was no separation between church and state for the most part. So the other thing we have to understand, although of course our ancestors, as Pedro pointed out, were thinking individuals and human beings, we have to understand that there is there's a lot of evidence too that our ancestors were being forcibly Christianized and that they didn't have a choice. So we have to understand too that when we find, for instance, something like a baptismal record, there's a lot of people who wanna misinterpret that as yay, isn't this great that this enslaver allowed this person to become an Anglican or a Catholic? No, there was no allowing about that. When we find that baptismal certificate, we have to understand that that enslaver forced that person, that person would not have had a choice. And the other thing too, is at the same time as enslaved people were being forcibly Christianized, they were being denied, actively denied access for themselves to church sacraments, like choosing to have a church marriage. So for instance, if you read um, the autobiography, um, the story, the slave narrative of Mary Prince, that's the only slave narrative we have. Slave narratives are a genre um, 
usually written by or, or dictated uh, by uh, formerly enslaved people who were able to escape. So Mary Prince's book, uh, she was enslaved in Antigua, born in Bermuda, uh, Turks and Caicos, et cetera, is the only one we have of an enslaved female in the Caribbean. But she writes harrowingly about going to get married and choosing that for herself to a free black man and being brutally punished by her enslavers, man, the male and the female, uh, for, for thinking that it was within her remit to make such a decision for herself. Um, and being also additionally um, upset because she married a free man who they felt she was gonna divert her labors to his household, to that household. So, so the, the issue of Christianity is a very complex one because of course, many anti-slavery activists were also Christian, right? So the abolitionists were also called themselves Christians and the pro-slavery advocates, the enslavers and their surrogates like printers called themselves Christians. Now on the issue of why reparations are so slow in the Canadian context, one of the key issues we have to think about is where in the Americas reparations, conversations and actions have been advanced places like the United States more so than here, the Caribbean parts of South America are places where black people are visible and powerful in things like media, politics and academia. That's not true in Canada. We do not have the same representation. And one example, I already brought up the fact there's very few people like myself and Carol who are teaching in Canadian institutions who teach Canadian slavery. But also black people in Canada are just not being given jobs in academia in any discipline and any field across the board. We're just not present. And an example of that is when I left McGill after 17 years, I taught at McGill from 2003 to 2020. McGill is massive and McGill is routinely ranked number one in the nation, the number one university in, in the country, McGill or U of T. They just go back and forth. When I left McGill, they had 5,000 people who were teaching, lecturers and professors. Of those 5,000, 1,726 were tenure and tenure track professors. 10 of us were Black. In 2020, 2020, do you understand the numbers we're talking about here? 11 indigenous people, 10 black people out of 1,726. So we are not there. So in the places like the Barbados where you have Sir Hilary Beckles advancing the cause and you have Professor um, Welch advancing the cause you know, in, in the Caribbean, we don't have the same voice. We don't have the same status. We're not being employed in the media, in politics. We're not there. And it's the Black people, really, the Black professionals, academics, et cetera, who are advancing this conversation. So we have a lot of work to do in Canada. And the knock-on effect, too, is that, as Pedro really clearly articulated, you know, there's, there's a plethora of subfields of study of, like, transatlantic slavery studies is a field. There's all these subfields. There's the people who only study maternity or only study nutrition or only study fertility or only study resistance. Canada, those subfields are not yet developed. We're still scratching the surface. There's still people publishing the overview. It's like, come on people, we got to advance the scholarship. But how do you do that if people like myself and Carol are few and far between? Because where's the next generation of scholars come from? Comes from our students from our MA students and our PhD students. If there's literally, I'm not joking, there's right now at the moment probably five of us who are employed at a university who are experts in Canadian slavery. Where's that next generation gonna come from? So this is a part of the, the question of the slowness of the reparations conversation in Canada. It's connected to our absence, black ac academics in Canadian academia. Thank you, Charmaine. Uh, Carol has her hand up, so let's hear from Carol before we go from okay. And I'll keep it brief because I think we want to move into wherever we're going to go for the next flow of the conversation. Um, I just wanted to say on the question of um, the suffering and uh, what happened that would justify rest reparations. So yes, there is a response and it comes from multiple places of amnesia, a kind of cultural amnesia, forget about it. It was horrific, it was terrible, move on, live in the now, step into the future, forget the past. 
However, as many of us who do historical work know and from our own life experiences, um, when we look in the past, we, it's interesting how we meet ourselves, images of ourselves, experiences, human emotions, and so forth. It's not easy to escape the past. It's with us. It's shaped us. It's like Octavia Butler's main character in Kindred, a Black woman in the U.S. who, through some magical force, finds herself meeting her white male ancestor who was an enslaver in the past. And when she finally escapes into the present moment, she's stuck in a wall. And in order to move into her present moment, she has to make the choice to wrench herself away from that past and she loses the bottom part of her arm. Now, it's a gripping image, but it's a powerful metaphor that even when that past and its details are not articulated in their gripping intensity and their horror, that it has a way still of impacting us, you know? So I think that a part of, of um, not dealing with reparations also is perhaps a fear of a confrontation with the past and what it means, the horror of it. It is horrible stuff, but it behooves us, I believe, to do that confrontation uh, with ourselves on an individual level, um, as communities, to do the necessary work, to do that reparation, as Pedro has said, also involves, um, you know, repair, reparative uh, kinds of work. So um, I wanted to make that point. The second point I wanted to make was about the Christianity and uh, uh, Black people in Christianity, people who have experienced colonization in Christianity and what it means. Um, and I appreciate Pedro's comments. I appreciate Charmaine's comments as well. I like to think of things on a continuum um, of total acceptance, rejection perhaps, but for strategic purposes um, of indigenous African religions. Um, complete rejection of Christianity and the continuation of indigenous African religions, albeit within the context of the Americas and the historical experiences that people had and the traditions that borrow and adapt and are inventive. So my work on the spiritual Baptists, for instance, shows, you know, introduction of Christianity adaptation and interpretation of Christianity from the life experience, vantage point, and liberatory perspectives of people of African descent under enslavement, passed down through generations, also referencing Yoruba traditions, also referencing in a Trinidadian, Trinidadian context, um, uh, the Orisha, yes, but also uh, Hindu deities as well, too. So these traditions are elastic, open, inventive, and they, in effect, I think, um, show the kind of innovative approach and toolkits, so to speak, cultural toolkits, reparative toolkits that enslaved peoples and their descendants developed to survive the experience. So I wanted to make those points to acknowledge the um, kind of plethora of responses uh, to Christianity and also the very real um, uh, experience of the horror of enslavement and the reaction to turn away from. There are no litanies of sufferings that are familial stories. Grandmother was a masterful storyteller. Wonderful. I heard a Nancy stories, her stories in St. Kitts and Nevis, her stories in Antigua, a little bit about Dominica and so on. Her grandfather, you know, John Henry and all of that. I heard not one story of any beating, any licking as she would say but her language was still peppered with the phrases of 
the post-emancipatory period coming out of enslavement, free paper bond, if your freedom is gone, if some freeness that you were experiencing, man on horseback wouldn't see that. If you're trying to get off of something, you're working under heavy manners. I have a whole list of them that come out of that laboring experience. And there you hear some of the punishments as well, but the personal litany of suffering, for the most part, in the storytelling experience of you know, uh, family lives, they wanted to spare us. They knew, but they wanted to spare us that, to not carry that burden, but we may still feel it like that invisible arm. And I'll stop there. Thank you all for these very full and rich responses and have named again the, the need in some ways for self-repair, what that looks like. Um, and also this, this link between redress, repair, reparations, and the role of the church in all of this and, and naming the need that the church needs to atone. Um, there's a couple of questions that have emerged in the, in the chat in terms of what atonement looks like or what action looks like, um, and two um, related but different questions. So uh, one question has emerged around, um, a person is wondering, um, uh, knowing that their ancestors ha would have owned slaves a long time ago, uh, what can they do uh, in a, um, beyond sharing the history? And also what might be some ways to make amends? Um, so if you're if a, a descendant of someone who was slave owners, what that might look like. So that's one question. The other question that's emerging in the chat, which um, already has some responses, is um, for people, uh, for Black Canadians, um, what can we as Black Canadians do to bolster, bolster the academic work that's already happening and to move the conversation uh, on reparations forward? Um, so two um, related but different questions, but both about actions, what can people do? So one for Black mm -hmm. Canadians, one for descendants of, of mm -hmm. people who... Um, mm -hmm. Can um, I jump in on the descendants just really quickly? Because mm -hmm. I, when I taught at McGill, my, McGill was, listen, McGill was very white with a student body too. So when I'd have a class of 100 Adele, there would be maybe 10 BIPOC people, Black, Indigenous, people of color students out of 100. So when I taught a class for years called the visual culture of slavery, where I taught them about transatlantic slavery through the lens of the art and visual culture archive that I mentioned. So the first thing I do for day one, first of all, what do you know about transatlantic slavery? Number two, who here knows that slavery happened in Canada? In my 17 years at McGill, I had one student put their hand up. One student say they knew that slavery had existed in Canada. And I said, oh, this is wonderful. Finally, could you please share with the the class, the content that, that, that you got from your teacher, was it high school, where, where was it? And they said, we got no content. We got slavery happened in Canada and the teacher proceeded to teach about somewhere else. And of course that's not the teacher's fault. You can't teach what you've never learned. Here I am a scholar of transatlantic slavery. I, I you know, routinely teach and, and uh, do research on Jamaica, on the USA and Canada. Never had a class on slavery. I had to train myself how to do this research, right? So I totally get that. But my point here is I encourage my students, I encourage the audience I talk to is listen, first of all, how does slavery get dismissed? It gets dismissed by being coded as a black history only. That's why they roll it out in February, 28 or 29 days if we're lucky, that's when we get to talk about it, at least in Canada and the USA. Listen, people, who are the enslavers? Who are the safe, safe captains for the most part? Who are the crews? Who are the printers? Who are the jailers? who write all the surrogates, who are the overseer, they're all white, mainly men, but also women as well, right? How is it not a white history? You tell me how transatlantic slavery is not a white history. It's a black history, it's a white history, it's an indigenous history, it's an Asian history too, because who's brought into to islands like Jamaica at, in 1834 because the enslaved people, the formerly enslaved people are like, I'm out of here, I'm not gonna work for this person who brutalized me anymore. South Asians. So it's a multiracial, multi-ethnic, very complex history. And so white people, one of the things to this question, how can you make a change as a white person where this is your history is first to acknowledge that it's your history. 
right? And to be open to exploring in your family those silences. When I send my students home and say to them, listen, everybody go home, not just the black kids in the room, everybody go home. I want everybody to go home. If you're lucky enough to have the grandparent alive or the great grandparent, I want you to ask them if you have any connections in your family to this colonial history or slavery. Listen, one year a student came back and she was very, very brave because I know people found things out they didn't want to share Adele. And she came back, the student said, listen, Professor Nelson, I asked the question and my family disclosed to me that one of my great, great grandfathers was the, the governor of Virginia. Hello, planter, plantation owner, enslaver. Nobody told her this. She had to ask a direct question. She had to ask, she had to go home and say, did anyone in my family ever own enslaved people to, to get their family to speak about this? So what are the silences too? You know, Carol speaks so eloquently about the silences in, in, in page or two of the traumas that black people are holding. Also white people are sitting on a lot of things. They're also sitting on archival holdings in their family too. Then sometimes these things should be turned over to the provincial archive or the state archive or the national archive, right? So, so part of it is to, Yes, acknowledge that the privilege you're experiencing today as white people is inherited from your ancestors who oppressed our ancestors, right? Own that history, but also then how are you going to contribute to this healing, to this redress? What will your process, how will you act um, to help then in the process of reconciliation and repair, right? And you cannot do that. There's no step forward unless you first acknowledge what it is that your your ancestors participated in of which you are the beneficiary today so i think a lot of it is again to our to start at the point of acknowledging slavery as a multi-racial multi-ethnic history it all starts there if we have white people in denial of that and the connection of these histories to them and their families and their ancestors then they cannot go forward in the process of healing as two partners Thank you, Charmaine. Uh, let's hear from Pedro, please. Yes. Um, the question as to what can someone do um, when they've discovered that they have an ancestry that is heavily involved in enslaving of human beings, what can they do? Um, requires us also to understand, again, the complexity of the social order that we're dealing with. Um, in some of my own research, where I have looked at, at three colored, three blacks, one of the things that emerges that some, that many, I'm not saying that in comparison to the white enslavers, but many of the enslavers in several Caribbean jurisdictions were in fact themselves formerly enslaved or descendants of formerly enslaved persons. We have a character in Barbados called Rachel Pringle. And there's another person who I've unearthed from the, from the archival sources called Susanna Ostrahan and the others. And their own enslaved people, or a national heroine, the only, well, the second, the first female national heroine of Barbados, Sarah Ann Gill. Own enslaved people. And so that we have to ask some, some questions about what happens in the society. And I try to rationalize this in this way because personally I've asked the question, how come is it that we never knew that some of our, our, our ancestors, our black ancestors own enslaved people too? What happened? What happened in Africa? Well, in the case of the, of the free colors, I've come to the view and I've raised, and based on a question, the question is this, what is one of the clearest badges of your freedom that you might have in a, in, a, in a slave society? Well, I have argued that one of the clearest badges of your freedom is your, your capacity you have to own another human being. So it is not surprising that when some of the people get set free, they've, 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 um, they've been manumitted. It is not surprising that following that manumission, that they then themselves become involved in enslavement and save another person. Now, some of that, of course, has to do with the socialization. And it's, uh, if in enslavement become normalized within a society, we shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us. But then the question then um, comes, how do, 
persons who discover that their black ancestors um, own enslaved um, workers. Uh, what do they do? Well, it is the same answer you have to give to all of the enslavers, all of the descendants of enslavers, that the process begins by developing the knowledge base. In other words, you really cannot acknowledge uh, a fault. You cannot re you really cannot acknowledge um, the historical past unless you know what that past looks like. And, and there is uh, most definitely uh, a need for, uh, for persons who find that their ancestors own enslaved people uh, for them to begin to get knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than they have been in the past. What a history. It, it, otherwise, you, you get a bit of sentimentalism that creeps into it. Uh, people begin to want to atone for something that they don't even quite understand. Uh, that, that's a problem that we, that we have to work on. And permit me though, just to come back to some of that Charmaine raised, uh, Dr. Nelson raised, Professor Nelson raised earlier about the question of forcing Christianity on some of the ancestors. I, I couldn't, I, I, I almost did not want to resist responding to that. When you look at the narratives of many, as she mentioned, um, um, Prince, um, the enslaved woman, but there are several others who we can turn to. Equiano himself became a Christian and he was not forced into Christianity. And in fact, having become a Christian, he wrote to the, to the, the, uh, the monarch of England on behalf, quote unquote, of my African brethren to challenge the whole question of, of enslavement. Frederick Douglass, the American enslaved man, will tell you that the planters did not want their, ens their, ens their enslaved workers to be Christianized, that they kept them as far as they could from the Bible and from church. Now, some planters did that, but we can't make generalizations. We can't generalize that, both, that, the, that the whole, across the whole spectrum of, of, of the enslaved, pop enslaved population, that these are forced to accept Christianity. You have to understand that the thing is too complex for us to make that kind of judgment. In the context of the British Caribbean, and um, several, several researchers have, have looked at this, Christianity was not, proselytizing was not common. It was not common to, um, for uh, planters to, as it were, to, to baptize the enslaved people. So in some cases it happened. I'm not denying that happened, but it's not uh, so common as we think. I don't know what happened in Canada, clearly, uh, but, I, but I, I'm very, 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 very familiar with what happened in the British Caribbean. In the Caribbean, we have enslaved people who adopt Christianity and they use Christianity as a metaphor of resistance. And I'm going drawing the reference to one particular uh, incident, and that is the, the 1831-1832 Baptist Rebellion or Christmas War Christmas um, war in Jamaica. That is the biggest slave rebellion in Jamaica led by Baptist and slave, were, and slave persons who had adopted Bapt the Baptist faith. In those cases, these persons did not buy into the narrative of the enslavers and they did not and uh, were not forced into Christianity. There are too many references, too many um, sources we have from formerly enslaved people who, um, who adopted Christianity and then question, use their theological reasoning to question how it was that, 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 that some of the enslavers could be called themselves Christians and still enslave their, 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 their fellows. So I'm saying I accept that there's some, there's some evidence of some force in, in some cases, but we cannot generalize um, about uh, people adopting enslaved, oh, sorry, Christianity. Can and I Jamaica jump in for a second, Adele, too, because Pedro, I want to respond to, to, to and I, I, I appreciate that you're complexifying our arguments here in our discussions, yes. but in terms of Black people owning slaves, too, there's yeah. a lot of ev archival evidence, too, that a lot of times when Black people and slave people, former enslaved people owned slaves, they mm -hmm. were often mixed race, race and slave people who were manumitted by their fathers who were white, often That's planters true. or overseers. Yeah, this is an important point though. They're That's mixed race true. people who are children of the, the, the white, either planter or his surrogates, who Quite then on that often get a pang of conscience and write into the will, I'm yes. gonna be you, I'll give you some, I'll give you land, I'll give, this happened a lot 
in Jamaica with um, mixed race women going into the industry of keeping lodging houses before there was a so-called hotel industry in Jamaica. How did they come across the land and the lodging houses or what we call inns in, in a place like Canada? Is that they inherited them from the enslavers who were keeping them as concubines. These were not consensual sexual relationships. But these men then felt some kind of emotion towards these women and their mixed race sons and daughters and would often bequeath then some of the wealth um, in terms of land, in terms of property, and in terms of people. So we have to understand too the hierarchy here that white people were constructing was one which would strategically turn black people against each other in terms of who became wealthy, who inherited property, who was lighter complected in terms of the nonsense pseudosciences of a lighter complexion, close whiteness means more intelligence, more beauty, et cetera, right? And then who, how do you resist that type of inculcation in that discourse as an enslaved person too? Who's the enslaved person who says, I'm gonna free these enslaved people because I understand that this is wrong and I've suffered this. And who's the one who's like, well, they're calling me something called a quadroon and my life is better, so I'm going to run with it, right? So if they understand the complexity too of being born into a language and a history and a, and a socialization, right? So, but it is a very complex question then of who are these black people who end up being slave enslavers and how they come about that status. And a lot has to do with complexion and who their father were free white men of property, right? Mm -hmm. And again, just to clarify, I never said everybody was forced to be Christ um, Christianized, but there was a lot of that. And then in places like the Spanish Caribbean, you have religions like Santeria, right? Mm -hmm. Where there were cloaking within Christianity, their Yoruba or their West African traditions. So externally, the white enslavers would say, oh, they're being good Catholics or good Anglicans, but really they were also practicing the spirituality, the African West, cult, uh, West, uh, West African spirituality that those enslavers had banned. So yes, the, the question of Christianity and the preservation of African spiritual practice is very complex. And I would I, I absolutely would say that it's universally imposed, but we have to understand that for many, it was imposed. So, uh, so how do we go about that region by region basis, looking at the evidence, looking at the archives, et cetera. I agree with you, it's very complex. No, I, I agree. So, so thank I, you, I, thank you, Charmaine. I, I'm, that's going yes. to on, on this point. Excellent. The, thank you for naming the complexity, Charmaine, and thank you for, thank you for okay, this engaging I, conversation. I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in just to keep us moving because I'm, I'm aware of time. This has been such an engaging conversation um, that the time has flown by, and we're uh, <laughs> almost at the end of our scheduled time to be together. And so, um, I wish we had more time to keep this conversation going because I feel like in some ways we're just, we're really. We're really here. <laughs> we're, we're engaging in, in good, important conversation. And um, uh, yes, I wish we had more time. But alas, uh, we are coming to the end. And so I wonder if um, from our panelists who are here, if maybe you might be willing to offer closing remarks, uh, maybe just um, a minute or so um, to sum up anything that you've heard or anything that you feel a thread that's unfinished, um, something else that you want to say uh, just in a minute or so. And then we'll go back to Paul um, and Paul will um, offer us a closing prayer um, and send us off on our way. So um, back to each of you panelists, um, in case you want to offer a, a closing word. Um, uh, in a minute or so, um, and then we go back to Paul. May, may I uh, very quickly um, um, thank um, Charmaine for, 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 for the comments that she just offered. Um, but I, I must say that I, I have done a substantial amount of research on, on free Blacks and free mulattoes, free colors, ownership of enslaved people. And while there is some evidence that some, and I again, I'm I'm stressing the sum. Some women in particular, especially lodging house owners, and, and my own book, um, Slave Society in the City, deals at length with what happened to the many of those women. Some got their enslaved um, property from their fathers or from their lovers or, or in various ways. But there are a lot of, uh, I've done, gone through hundreds of deeds, hundreds of deeds of conveyance, and the deeds tell me another story that there are people who are also actively purchasing 
enslaved and workers, and these are not all white. But that's not to excuse the, the, um, the ownership of enslaved people by, by Caucasians. It's just simply to point out that the matter is very complex and that, and that, we, that we have to be very, very careful as we make comments on what happened to our forefathers about uh, what we call generalizations that can easily be, be, um, be, um, be demonstrated not to be accurate um, once, once you look at what they call the exceptions. Uh, and finally, on, uh, on let me thank you, thank, thank, thank um, Reverend Walfall for uh, off, offering this opportunity. This this must be seen as a, a as a start. Even if you've had a little session before, this kind of discussion that we're having now removes the discussion from the intellectual um, shelves, from the from, from the libraries and from the university halls. And it places out there in the public. Many of those who are listening and watching on today will probably have heard some things that they would never have known before. And I want to encourage a continuation of this because this panel discussion must be seen as part of the process of education that we are going to be, we have to uh, deliver to our, to our publics. That's what they can begin to understand what our people experience and where we need reparations. We need reparations now. Thank, Thank you, Pedro. You. Thank you very much. Carol or Charmaine, any closing remarks from either of you? Um, sure, I, I, I can go. Um, I just want to respond very briefly to the question of Christianization. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve Davis, Davidson for your comment in, uh, in the chat. Um, I wanted to get to that point uh, about Christianization and the work of missionaries and the difference between uh, the Roman Catholic Church and Protestant missionaries. So that is very important for us to keep in mind if we are doing this work as researchers, if we're coming to this work as educators, and there are great, great resources that are available um, for us to be able to, to you know, um, uh, get a sense of the historical record. So the work of the late great Albert Rabateau um, in the Caribbean context, there are many other researchers as well. Um, and also in, in uh, Canadian context too. So you can go and do that search and, you know, do that library search and have that read. And the comment from Pamela Mordecai about the importance of, of the work of authors, fictional authors like Martin uh, Mordecai uh, and others who've written uh, poignantly uh, in fictional contexts that are based on historical research about some of these questions. They're not definitive answers, they are works of fiction, but they get at the heart of um, elucidating some of these matters. I think it's really great that people are asking these questions of refinement. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, which I think that historical name has a very Monty Python-esque sound, but it did the work of the Anglican Church founded in 1701, out of a concern for um, the uh, religious lives in British colonies, very active in the US South, not as much in the Caribbean, in Bermuda, more incursion uh, into the Caribbean in late 18th, early 19th centuries. And so that, you know, those records are there, um, those discussions are there about what Christianization meant. And I think richly what enslaved people did with Christianity, did with their own religious traditions, um, which if you listen to American popular music, you know, the music of the Black church uh, in the US, the music of the Black church across the border here in Canada as well, um, is the basis of popular music, popular American musics that are listened to all over the world. So we shouldn't really dis dismiss this discussion from um, everyday engagements, even if we don't know where that comes from. So I just want to leave it there. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate.
And thank you very much for your words, Carol. Um, Charmaine, over to you for closing remarks, please. Thank you so much, Adele. And thank you to Paul again and to my fellow panelists. Okay, so what do I want to say? I'll make this, uh, you know, you can only speak through your identity. So we're all always speaking through our identity and our experiences, but um, I'm cognizant and very conscious of doing so in the closing statements here. So what I want to say is that, um, you know, I've lectured in a lot, I've been blessed, you know, I've had a, a opportunities to lecture in various places around the world, in Europe, in the Caribbean, in um, Central America, across the USA, and then Canada, Mexico. And um, the Canadian audiences are the worst in terms of this work because, and what I mean by that, Canadian audiences actually push, push my research backwards because I have to go back and explain what slavery was, what Canadian slavery was. I have to start, I have to do a slavery 101. When I speak to people in other regions, they push me forward because there's already a base knowledge there. In the general public I'm talking about, not, a, not among academics, but again, it's not Canadians' fault. Not, but who amongst us had, have, has had the opportunity anywhere in elementary school, high school, college, et cetera, university in Canada to study any of this that we've talked about tonight? Most of us, the answer is no. I gave a, a lecture to, UF, U of T's senior alumni, probably five years ago, and brilliant group of people, mainly 50s to 80s. And some of the end came up to me and they were incensed. They were like, I, how, how did I do K to 13, right? When 13 existed and university, including grad degrees in this country and never learn about this 200 years. How is that possible? And this is obviously so foundational to who we are as a nation. There's a question, right? So what I want to say about that too is obviously we, you can understand from this conversation, we're living in the aftermath of slavery, right? If slavery was a boat and you turn around and look at the boat, there's a wake in the boat. We are in the wake of the boat. So we got to think about like the term that people use today, anti-Black racism. It's an imp impacting Black Canadians economically, in terms of education, in terms of our access to media and culture, in terms of politic, political engagement, law, healthcare is a huge one, right? In the USA recently, they've been talking about more and more about mater black maternal health, right? They, we, they had big um, publicity around the, the you know, near death experiences of millionaires like Beyonce and Serena Williams when they had their children. Millionaire black women who, you know, Serena, I think had an embolism or something was saying to nurse, I need X, Y, Z. And the nurse is telling her something else. She almost died because they don't listen to us in general, because again, this embedded 400 years relief that we are insentient, that we are brutish, that we're less than human, that we are unreliable um, uh, advocates for ourselves and unreliable uh, uh, in terms of being able to relate to other people, what it is we're actually feeling and experiencing. So the knock-on effects of the anti-Black racism, of course, in something like police brutality is literally killing us. It's lethal to us. So what I want to say too is how do we change this? How do we transform this? One huge thing for me as an art historian is, listen, people, we're never going to change anything without getting the media and the art the creatives need to be at the table. And that's a part of why at the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery, let me just plug what I'm doing. Why is it at an art and a design college? Because if we don't get the artist, the playwright, the painter, the person who's gonna make the film about Canadian slavery, we don't yet have a narrative film about Canadian slavery, right? If we want to sit here and talk about how many films, narrative Hollywood films there are about American slavery, some of them stink, but lately they've been some good ones like Django un uh, Unchained and 12 Years a Slave and Amistad, et cetera. We don't have anything about Canadian slavery, okay? And if we don't have those people, you're not gonna talk to the lay public because the lay public generally will not do this, will not come to a lecture like this where there's mainly academics and they will not pick up the academic book. So who's gonna write the trade history book? Who's gonna write the play? who's going to paint the, do the art exhibition, et cetera. That's why the fellows amongst the fellowships I've awarded, two of them so far have been artists in residence. We need the artist people. You got to support the artists and you have to support the, the black artists doing this work. The other thing is the media. 
2022, we've had our first documentary from the brilliant Jennifer Holness and David Sutherland, who are the co-owners of Hungry Eyes Media in Toronto. First documentary that dealt with Canadian slavery, 2022 people, BLK and origin story that aired in four parts on the History Channel, just 2022. Again, if we were to sit here and name all the ones on American slavery, how much time do you have? We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it in one night. The first one on Canadian slavery that started in the 1600s, covered the British and the French, four provinces, BLK and origin story, check it out, but it's 2022. Where are the creatives? So we have to do, that's gonna change the conversation. And again, for the wonderful people, thank you for attending here and, and for supporting us and asking how you can support us. I think one of the ways is that to be aware that there is a problem of anti-Black and, and just racism against BIPOC people in Canadian universities where we're not being employed and we're certainly not being um, you know, protected and retained in a lot of cases. People are being purged before they can even be tenured. And some of us have horror stories uh, to tell. I certainly am one of, one of those people. But what's happening is there's a Black brain drain in the nation. Many of the, the best and brightest Black Canadians go and get jobs in the USA or the UK. They leave the country. Okay, so what will it look like to have the support and a broader Canadian knowledge in the public sphere that we are struggling inside of these universities because we're totally outnumbered and we're totally unsupported. Up to now, EDI, the so-called uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion has been window dressing. It's been policies with no money behind it, no staffing behind it. Things are starting to change slowly, but we have to hang on and watch. We have to hold people's feet to the fire. But just as, as I close here, Adele, to say, listen, I'm leaving Canada. I resigned from NASCAD. I'm going to the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And why did that happen? Listen, let me tell you, I had at NASCAD the highest research chair awarded by the Canadian government, a tier one Canada research chair. And they treated me horribly at NASCAD for two years. Okay, this doesn't happen to white people. First of, all, first of all, white men for 22 years were the only ones getting these research chairs. They had to be sued. They sued the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada in Ottawa to make more diverse and make them track how they were assigning these research chairs. So finally, some women, people of color are getting these chairs and this is what happens, right? So I want to say too, this is this is real. What is happening to us inside these at these institutions? I don't want to make it all about us, but listen, we're the ones doing the research. If we can't even do our jobs without being harmed, we're going to leave. We're going to leave, right? I've stuck it out in Canada for twenty years. I can't take it anymore. I'm leaving. I'm not saying America is a paradise, but I have a feeling that where I'm going, what I've negotiated for myself, will be a space where at least they'll leave me alone. Okay, and that's sad, but true. That's where I'm at, right? It's hard for me to imagine a place where I'll be supported fully because I've been up against it for two decades of just trying to eke out a space where people would not harm me, okay? But if I and Carol and, you know, Professor Walker and other people, Amani Whitfield and Calgary are doing this work, work and we're being harmed on the job, what does that mean then? Can we stay and do the work to, to make sure and caretake that next generation of scholars? In some cases, the answer is no. But we need to have a broader conversation about the nature of anti-Black racism in this country and all those dimensions. But one huge one is what's happening to us in academia. And if we're not in the universities, we can't do the research and the conversation is not gonna happen. So I think I thank you, Adele, and I thank you, Paul, and all the, the uh, fellow panelists and everybody for being here tonight. And I threw out some suggestions into the chat about what, you know, thank you to the person who asked, what can, can you do to support us? There's things you can do to support us. And thank you for being here too. Mm. Thank you, Charmaine. And thank you, Carol. And thank you, Pedro. Thank you for sharing your honest reflections, your challenges, your uh, encouragements. All of these things have been incredibly helpful. And in the chat, um, a number of people are saying that they've been inspired. They're um, wanting to do more education for themselves. They're um, committing themselves to learn more. A few people have talked about um, wanting to take more action. So uh, certainly your words have inspired um, um, many among who are here today.
So again, words of thanks to all of you. Um, I'm sorry that Russell was not here to be part of this conversation as well. Um, we are missing his wisdom, but we are deeply grateful for all of the wisdom that you have offered today. Um, Paul Douglas Walfall, um, we will offer to you the final words uh, to close us off and to offer uh, further reminders about um, what might, um, what else is happening around Emancipation Day. So thanks again to everyone for being here. Thanks again to our panelists. And Paul, over to you for closing words, please. Thank you, Adele. Um, and thank you also to Carol, Charmaine, and Pedro. I have been enriched by the discussion. And I must say that I'm the second time we're having the Emancipation Panel discussion. And it, it has given much food. Uh, we received apologies from Ross that he was not able to join us because of um, scheduling conflicts and we are deeply sorry that he was not able to be with us this evening. I forgot to introduce myself. Thank you Adele for introducing me. I am Paul Douglas Walfall, Minister at First United Church in Fort Saskatchewan and a member of the Black Clergy Network of the United Church of Canada. Our observance reflection on emancipation continues tomorrow with a national service which will be held online on the United Church of Canada YouTube channel. It begins at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, I won't try to give the time zone differentiations. I always mix it up and get it wrong. Uh, it's at 11 um, Eastern Daylight Time. The preacher will be the Reverend Siddiqui Little Forbes. It has been wonderful that we are able to reflect and I'm deeply indebted to all our panelists and to our moderator. As we close, let us give thanks as we remember the blessings of God and our ancestors, both those who have struggled and remember that while emancipation has been given, we still are marching forward, pressing forward for freedom. Let us pray. And now may the grace of the God who shepherded and protected our African ancestors as they crossed the Atlantic, the love of Jesus that held the enslaved ones and reminded them that they're not alone, the power of the Holy Spirit that continues to empower guide and lead the sons and daughters of Africa and all other races to justice, to love, and to righteousness. May the triune God be with us now and always. Amen. Thank you all. Walk good. One love. Thank you.